ওয়াটার <laughs> I think we suffered 9.1% of the GDP loss because of these climate changes. Absolutely. I think you highlight a very important point that Pakistan is an example in front of the world. You know, how climate catastrophe can even affect nations who are not contributing uh, that amount towards, uh, you know, global carbon emissions. Less than 1%, but damaged in billions and billions of dollars. Uh, you know, even UN Chief Antonio Guterres also used that example, uh, highlighted all the moments, uh, you know, of his trip to Pakistan where he witnessed the devastation due to floods as well. Uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif has been advocating not just on this COP27 forum where Pakistan is also the co-chair, but also on various international forums that all of us uh, must come together. And, you know, I love the quote which I saw yesterday uh, by Minister for Climate Change, Sheri Rahman, and it was written there in, on, on Pakistan's pavilion true. as well, that what happens in Pakistan will not stay in Pakistan. True, true, true. That this is the adaptation of what goes around, comes around, yes. right, Ahmed? And we've also seen that how President, uh, uh, Prime Minister Shabazz Sharif is also the vice president of the, uh, this conference. Mm -hmm. And that signifies the importance of Pakistan's position, especially when it comes to the discourse on the climate change, mm -hmm. that how much vulnerable we are. And the matter of the fact is that Pakistan has very little contributions in these global carbon emissions because uh, the industrialized nations, the rich nations who have led this industrial revolution, who have very mercilessly mm -hmm. exploited the earth's resources. And because Absolutely. of this exploitation, we are here at this point of the time. Yes, we can all create an awareness, of course, wherever we are. But now coming to the uh, professionals, I think people who do mean business, who are already uh, in their various domains, in their own uh, respectable offices are contributing to this mm -hmm. cause and who I think have a better understanding of this. We've been joined by such individuals in studios as well. True. So without any further ado, we would like to introduce our guest. We are very glad that we have been joined by Ms. Amina Ali Kamal, who happens to be the spokesperson of the UNHCO Pakistan. Assalamu alaikum and thank you so much for coming to our show. Assalamu alaikum and thank you for having me. Thank you for being Wonderful. on this. We've also been joined uh, by Mr. Irfan Tariq, the former Director General of okay. the climate change as well. Assalamu alaikum, sir. How are you? Assalamu alaikum. I'm very well. Sir, good morning. Nice. Thank you for coming on the show. Uh, now, Ms. Kamal, when we talk about this recent example that has happened, that was the climate catastrophe. Some have even referred to it as the glacier outburst as well. You know, there are many terminologies that have been used, have affected Pakistan. Yes, we see that. But now moving that to climate change, uh, justice, climate change. I mean, let's talk about the significance of COP27. The UN chief himself has mentioned this, that, you know, the time to act is now. How important is it for world leaders to understand that there is no leverage? You don't have any time that you can postpone this. It is now or never. You know, actually, uh, you've, you've uh, raised a very pertinent point, and that is that climate change is here. Hmm. You know, the reality is here. I think... Uh, the world has finally woken up to the reality of climate change that we're going through it you know mm -hmm. it's no longer oh if we don't do this it'll happen it's here it's happening and it's happening to those countries that are contributing and those countries that are not contributing and it's it's of course pakistan suffered the most right now it's one of the largest uh, disasters that this uh, uh, year has seen but it's not the only one mm -hmm. we can see it happening in every country and uh, this this wakes us all up to the reality that, as you very uh, correctly said at, and quoted, that what uh, is in Pakistan doesn't stay in Pakistan mm -hmm. because we are seeing it everywhere. So um, I think the world is waking up to this reality, and this COP is extremely important in us having that conversation in very real terms now. You know, we're not talking about 
the future. We're not saying, oh, if this, and we're not talking about predictions, we're talking about reality now, mm -hmm. which is why the loss and damage is becoming so important. I mean, it's a, it's a conversation that we've been having, but it's become very real. We are seeing the results of mm -hmm. it, that this is what's happened. Similarly, we also have to now talk about resilience and adaptation because this is now happening and it will continue to happen even as we start working towards taking measures that will control future uh, climate um, uh, change uh, for climate action. We need to start talking about adaptation. We, talk, we need to start talking about resilience because at the end of the day, we are talking about people. We're talking about humans. I, I think that's a very pertinent point that, you know, we've estimated the losses in billions of dollars, uh, the cost of infrastructure redevelopment, rehabilitation. But that one factor that I think has still not been debated enough is the humanitarian effect of it. That's very true. So uh, moving the conversation uh, forward, we want to talk about the NDC's nationally determined contributions. Mm -hmm. And the four viewers out there, there's this document in which the countries pledges that how they mm -hmm. will combat the climate change. So in this conference, Irfan Saab, I think around uh, 30 countries have uh, developed their NDCs, which is a very low number. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about Pakistan's part in it. Have we devised that? And what are the contributions of Pakistan in uh, having this NDC document? So thank you very, very much for this question. Uh, let's go back a little. What really are NDCs? Uh, you would recall that in 2015, we had this Paris Agreement. And True. the Paris Agreement asked all parties, 195 countries, to develop whatever they can do to address climate change, mm -hmm. both in adaptation and mitigation and all other spheres of uh, climate change. Uh, with, after 2015, we started preparing our um, set of uh, nationally determined contributions. The last ones were submitted in 2021, and they are extremely, extremely ambitious. Now, th there are two points which I would like to highlight. One, that they're extremely ambitious, and what we have committed is, we have told the whole world we'll reduce 50% of our emissions. 50% is a very, very huge number. Right. And very few countries, I don't think, I, I, I only recall two or three countries which have surpass this number, we would reduce 50% of these emissions subject to the condition that the, the global community supports us. Right. Now we are looking forward to that support. And the second most important point is these NTCs, the nationally determined contributions, they were finalized in consultation with provincial government, each and every institution we can get hold of. Each and every institution which is impacted by the climate change or which can contribute even in, in future towards emissions. So I think what we have done is something which, is, which was uh, extremely important. Mm -hmm. And in Pakistan was highlighted. You would recall the um, uh, uh, opinion of the uh, UNFCC um, head. And they, she appreciated Pakistan's NDCs. They were very ambitious. Well, uh, and now we are into implementation of these NDCs, and we look forward to the support from the global community as committed as committed in the in the climate change convention. Right. The developed countries they've got to support us, countries like Pakistan and the developing countries, so that they can take action. Mm -hmm. right. so, and now, uh, j just if you uh, if you allow me, Please. this is a decade of action. You right. see, the intergovernmental panel on climate change. Mm -hmm. Uh, in its recent uh, report have indicated that if we don't take action in, during this decade, the global temperature ride w uh, rise would be irreversible, True. which actually means the glo this planet would be become inhabitable. So it's, ex it's extremely serious, not only for us, for right. the global community, for the south and the north, developed and uh, developed, uh, developing countries. Right. Sir, you mentioned about uh, the climate conference on uh, in 2015, which was about the Paris Agreement, where the world leaders came about and uh, pledged that they would keep the uh, global warmings to 1.5%, mm -hmm. uh, which is uh, below the pre-industry level. And also, we have seen the COP conferences are going on from 1992, which was the first one which ha was held in the Rio. And uh, we have the conference in this year, too. So we have been uh, having these conferences. What comfort? could we derive from this conference is because I so what is the silver line from this conference so you you're absolutely right this whole started in 1992 right and at that time also Pakistan was represented by the then Prime Minister 
and Pakistan has always, during these 27 COPs, has played a very, very proactive, very responsible. Yes, we are a very small contributor to global warming, but as a responsible nation, we have always been very positive in um, the whole multilateral process. Right. During these 27 COPs, Pakistan has, uh, uh, has many times, and right now as well, led the whole developing countries. Right now, Pakistan is the chair of G77, and this is the confident, uh, confidence imposed on Pakistan, expressed on Pakistan by the developing countries, where they, they, they feel safer in Pakistan's hands uh, when Pakistan so speaks. How, how, do you, how do we see this policy? Because if I turn the clock 10 years back, and I highlight this, because 10 years back it was then the same government, uh, and the focus was still on uh, renewable energy projects. I tend to go to the Gajal and Solar Park. There were many initiatives that were being taken, including exploring more avenues for hydroelectricity as well. There were many things that were happening. Now, Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif himself expressed his passion as extraordinary for working on climate change. Now, when you've got a statesman representing your country who is the center of attention in COP27, uh, and he expresses his passion as extraordinary and says that he is committed to working on this. What does this signify to the world as part of Pakistan, that how serious is Pakistan and how practically has Pakistan implemented this? So one, this shows the seriousness of Pakistan in addressing climate change. Mm. So this, it cannot go beyond this level. This is the highest level we have. Mm -hmm. And we are there on the stage telling the whole world we are the most impacted, and yes, we are the most serious. We want to take action. Mm. Now, the second point is, I think now we need to turn all those promises and all those uh, commitments into action. Mm -hmm. And Kaidazam Solar Park and the solarization campaign right now in Pakistan, I think they are very good uh, examples to be showcased. Look at just this, not only the solar, the wind uh, energy, we are into all these renewable energies. And I think what, what we need to do is, upscale them mm -hmm. because look at the people the, the level of poverty in our country and the uh, the people who, who really need to develop we cannot stop them from developing mm -hmm. and this is and the best way to develop is the greener way going through um, renewable energies promoting um, uh, electric vehicles or um, uh, vehicles with clean cleaner fuel agriculture we uh, cultivate um, um, uh, agricultural produce, which is mm. climate compatible. So I think the greener way, which is we have uh, uh, a direct, uh, we have the direction shifted towards that, and I, and I think it needs to be upscaled. Right. Hajar, one of the very uh, important aspects of climate change. There have been many things. You know, we've right. talked about global rise in temperatures, glaciers melting. You know, water levels, water scarcity. But one thing that we tend to, I think, not focus much upon, especially for a country like Pakistan that is agri-based, is that in the next couple of years, food security is going to be a very huge true, issue in the world. True. And it's not just food security. I think the climate-induced migration is also going to be one of the mm. major concerns because of the rising temperatures. So just imagine Sibi had 50 degree temperature. Mm -hmm. And it's the hum heat and the humidity level are far going to surpass the human survivability, mm -hmm. right? And that is going to induce a lot of migrations and Absolutely. we would have different sets of problems by then. Uh, so coming to you, ma'am, we want to talk about the loss and damage reparation mechanism. Delivering on the pledges, on the promises is not without its own set of challenges. Where are we on this? Yeah, before I answer your question, I'm going to add to the last uh, bit as well that uh, the government is uh, indeed very serious and I think the recently um, approved uh, framework, which is the Living Indus Framework, is another s very positive right. sign towards that. And uh, the government and the, U it, the UN supports the government. The initiatives that are outlined in there, and we were just discussing this yeah. a bit earlier as well, that if we're able to fulfill those, I think we're, we will, as a country within itself, also be in a great position right. um, uh, to adapt to the new changes. You mm -hmm. see, th it is changing. And as you said, you know, the climates are changing, people are moving. Uh, we are talking about loss and damage. Right. So what do we have to do? A uh, right now, the commitment of uh, the responsibility of the world is to come out and fulfill their responsibility in helping uh, those countries that are suffering from this. Right. Because it's as a, you know, this, um, when we talk about living in the world, we are living as neighbors. Right. right. So when we are causing damage or we are contributing towards something, mm -hmm. 
then of course those people who are affected by that you have to help them mm. out it's normal that's why the csr concept came about and everything right, that we right. you know that is those are the roots of it right. so loss and damage i don't think is 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 a question of should it happen right. it it i think it is a, a more of a question of when mm. are you going to do it right. or or do it now i think why right? isn't it happening why is, yeah i mean that. i i don't think that there is any more uh, there should be a debate on mm. that right. but however having having said that um while we do put a response uh, we seek support from the other nations and the international community um towards it we also need to work towards making ourselves resilient that we don't find ourselves in this situation mm. every year Very or true. all the time Absolutely. yes i mean yes um uh, what has happened mm. we should be supported and the world has a responsibility towards it but as as a community as a nation we also need to build back in a more adaptive way mm -hmm. this is an opportunity that we build back in a way that we don't find ourselves in the same situation and understanding the climate changes that are going to that are mm. there they're happening mm. right as we said it's a reality so i mean one thing is to uh, uh, as i said talk about okay what can we do to fix this yes but while we are fixing it we need to make sure that we are we are helping our people and helping ourselves mm -hmm. in a situation that we don't find ourselves in this situation yeah the right balance right. i think the needs right to be explored is what, and what need, we need the right balance is what we need needs to be uh, found as well so that you know that continues it fans up in your capacity as a former director general of climate change as well pakistan has very different dynamics uh, when we see it in the world uh, our infrastructure might not be that up to date we've got our limited resources then we've got economic uh, problems that we are trying to address as well in all of this in your capacity when you were in office uh, how uh, have you seen the system that we're devising or developing when we talk about the next couple of years to not just address climate change but take a lead in it when you talk about the comity of nations um the it's a very important question yeah uh, you see pakistan uh, as i said earlier pakistan expresses itself as a very responsible nation now what we have done recently during the past uh, some time um we have developed our institution yes there are gaps mm -hmm. and we need to address those gaps but practically practically what we have done is we have a legislation on climate change mm -hmm. we have a national policy on climate change and we have the institutions developed on climate change now uh, yes th their capacity the capacity of the institutions need to be uh, enhanced mm -hmm. the recommendations of the policy need to be uh, implemented and the uh, legislation needs to be seen uh, uh, whichever way it's going so i pakistan i would say with it within its limited capacity has done whatever whatever it could do mm. and that includes three primary as i said uh, initiative legislative policy measures and institutions and pakistan has showcased this pakistan would be one of the few countries which have got this sort sort of mechanism laid out now since this is the um, as i said decade of action we need to take actions with with the support of these now we have the mechanism laid down and this is time to act now mm -hmm. how, how how do you see the global engagement as well not just because of cop 27 but even before that when we uh, you know we see towards china when we talk about agriculture reforms we see towards many other countries you know mm -hmm. to learn from their experiences mm -hmm. Uh, uh, so uh, i think we had uh, uh, we have very interesting and very useful bilateral engagements mm. uh, uh with the multilateral process and with uh, bilateral countries as well um as i said uh, in 1992 we were we were then also the chair of uh, g77 mm -hmm. in bali we were again chair of uh, g77 R right now we are again so that's the confidence imposed by the multilateral uh, process on on pakistan with uh, bilateral countries like china like uh, germany like uae and even like uh, uh, egypt we have got mous signed with them and now we we are ready to take action on 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 all these fronts which which uh, are affected by climate change um uh, 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 you would see that we need resources for for going mm. into implementation we need capacities for uh, and technologies so that is where we we uh, look forward to the global community i think we we have this mechanism laid out we have those mous signed now is the time for action
Right, Miss uh, Amina. So the UNESCO uh, uh, the report said about the climate change is that one third of the glaciers of the world are going to be melt uh, in the within the thirty years, right? Uh, but also mentioned the silver lining where two thirds could be saved if we act and mm. limit the carbon emissions yeah. by one point five degrees. Do you feel, considering the current situation, there is a cautious uh, case of the guarded optimism there? I think so. I, I think that uh, that's why this COP also becomes very, very important, that these figures that, uh, you know, would sometimes seem like, oh, you know, maybe it'll happen, maybe it doesn't. <laughs> People are now looking at it that it is happening. You know, the, the whole uh, melting glaciers is an issue. And another thing that's happened that we've seen is that it's actually rained. It's rained a lot. So the floods have happened, mm. there's melting, but it's also rained and that's all mm. uh, climate change, you know, it's, it's a change that we're going through. So it's not just about one thing or the other, mm -hmm. we have to holistically change it, but I think it is very positive. And I think the, the reason why we're getting a lot of global attention, why we the debates are becoming more serious now, the discussions are becoming more action oriented mm. is because we feel that, okay, we need to do it. We need to do this now, there is no, there is no question about should we or shouldn't we. Mm. Is that okay? What do we need to do? And I think those are the kind of uh, discussion that we are looking at, even at the COP. Okay, how can countries help each other? Mm. What are the learnings? What are the best practices? Pakistan is leading a lot of this, and it's a great opportunity for Pakistan because the focus is on on us. Mm. And I think that right. this we've been provided a platform, and we are using it, and we are using it as you had said for the international engagement to. Uh, gain the support that we need and also drive the actionables because it's time for action now. Right. I think the we, we've moved the beyond. Yeah. The momentum is there, of mm. course. So I mentioned that in 1992 we had the first COP conference yeah. and they're still going on, right? We have now one. What sort of changes have you seen in the debate or the discourse around the climate change from 1992 till the present? So I think, uh, as I said, I think the... Have uh, you seen the changes of the of attitudes? Of course, I think right? that uh, this year is the biggest, uh, we, we see a very big uh, positive mm -hmm. uh, change uh, uh, within uh, the country as well, as well as uh, the international community, because uh, as I said, it's here, and I think the Secretary General is also, those were one of the few things that he started off with when he visited Pakistan, is like, it's happening. It's happening true, now. True. And those defiers cannot uh, deny it anymore, you know, right. that it is happening now. And I, that's why the conversation has changed. And I think that a lot of people might think, okay, what's, what's the cop? You know, what are we getting out of it? And uh, I say to them that this is, it's a global platform. Mm -hmm. What you do with that platform is up to you. Right. So it's up to us. And it's up to the world what they get out of this. And I think that there is a seriousness in getting good um, action out of it and talk about um, hard points rather than just mm -hmm. uh, you know, words and just discussions. But like initially, um, I, I, I highlighted as well that you know, some, some of us still fail to realize the humanitarian cost of it. Absolutely. And we don't realize Absolutely. that yes, we have to build a future home for our future generations. Mm -hmm. But what if those future generations are not protected for that home? Uh, I, you know, I, I say this all the time that even now, you know, with the floods, that uh, somehow I think we are forgetting those who still need the life-saving assistance. Mm -hmm. There are 9.5 million people who are still waiting for continued assistance, and they need it till uh, May. That's a reality. They're right. they're they're fighting for their survival. Right. So even as we talk about. Uh, the larger picture, mm -hmm. we should not forget that we're talking about human beings and what does this mean for people. So they need that, uh, they need a, uh, they need an environment where they can survive, where they can live. So the, uh, the migrations and all of that, people will do what they have to to survive. So I think that, home, uh, that whole uh, human angle is extremely important. Very, very, very uh, interesting that we you know explore so, so many opportunities and Hazra, each one of us in every capacity, and that's why I stress that we need, uh, you know, a, a greater strength on a, on the academics level as well to talk about climate change and, true. at the end of the day, environmentalists who can make a difference. That's true. So coming to Irfan Saab, uh, one last question before we wrap up the segment is, uh, let's talk about the solutions. So in this COP conference, nature-based solutions are the main talking points. What exactly does that mean? And uh, what is uh, Pakistan's contribution in the context of it? So Pakistan uh, has been a leader, has been recognized as a leader in um, climate solutions uh, through nature-based solutions. 
and you have seen that Pakistan uh, has done a lot on uh, protecting its uh, natural capital. Right. Uh, either it is in forestry or wildlife or wetlands. We have done. Uh, we have run through many programs, and Pakistan has been recognized for all this. Now, uh, trees and forestation. They are the most economic. We were just discussing this thing. Mm -hmm. Are the most economical, cost-effective solution to climate change because you know through ph photosynthesis, trees right. absorb carbon dioxide and they, they produce oxygen. Right. And with our resources, I think that's a huge contribution. We are expanding our natural capital. We are trying to expand our uh, forest cover. We are trying to protect our wildlife and we are pro protect, uh, trying to protect our blue economy as well. So these are some of the nature-based solutions which can. Uh, bring solutions to climate change. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think Pakistan has uh, shown tremendous potential in all these spheres. Definitely. Definitely. Uh, Irfan sir, thank you very much for joining us. We very understand much. your short on time, but I think it's been a very lovely discussion and there is a lot of hope uh, from your words of wisdom as well. On that note, I will take a short break. Uh, but we're going to hang on to uh, Ms. Kamal as well. And we've got so many other things regarding COP27 to discuss, not just the challenges, the solutions, but also I think uh, practical examples of True. implementation as well will be discussed on the show right after the short break. Stay tuned to World This Morning. and to carry forward our conversation further about the climate change and about how mm -hmm. the UN uh, Secretary General Antonio Guterres mentioned it's yeah. now or never that to save the humanity from the perils of the climate mm -hmm. change. So we still have Ms. Amina and we would like to throw this question to Ms. Amina. So uh, Ms. Amina, we have seen that the different set of challenges that are mm -hmm. emerging because of the climate change. Like Ahmed mentioned, there were 17 law events this year in Pakistan. There was forest fires. I don't think so. We had forest fires at such a massive scale uh, seen before. Mm -hmm. And then we have uh, glaciers melting. Then we have either we have water scarcity or we have so much water inundated into the Pakistan that uh, one third of the country submerged mm -hmm. under the water. What sort of green solutions Pakistan is doing to avoid this? And I have seen that there's a lot of solar business which is cropping up. Uh, I think in every street, at least two or three houses have the solar energy. Uh, should we be cautiously optimistic about the future? Uh, absolutely. I think one should always be optimistic <laughs> about the future. Hope is never lost. Uh, ho hope is never lost. And I, I, and I think that uh, uh, more than hope, we need to talk about actions. And, mm. and, and I look at the, uh, the youth and the future. And, you know, I always find that, you know, they have that energy. I mean, I still have that energy, but still that energy to say, okay, what do we need to do? So that's what you know it's all about like right. um, so absolutely on th on the optimism side pakistan is suffering a lot True. along with the rest of the world and unfortunately or for whatever it is is that we find ourselves in a situation uh, geographically where we where we suffer the uh, the climate change uh, the most whether it is high heats which uh, rising temperatures, which which cause the uh, glacier melting, which cause forest fires, then, um, as I said, the the rainfall mm -hmm. and you know there's uh, there's also mm -hmm. um, lack of rain as well. You know there right. there has been drought as well. Right. Uh, if you just allow me, we've got yeah, another sure. guest. We'd just like Absolutely. to incorporate. With us. So we're very honoured to be joined by an environmentalist, uh, Mariam Shabir, who is joining us on World this morning. Good morning, Mariam. Assalamualaikum. How are you? 
Good morning. Walaikum salam. I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Shabir, uh, what would you like to first of all uh, highlight when we talk about the importance of this year's COP27 and especially I think the highlight, the center of attention has been uh, that Pakistan and Prime Minister Shahbaz Sharif as the co-chair of this conference as well. I think what I like the most is that this year conference have uh, at least Pakistan pavilion because uh, when I went to pre-COVID conference, there was like hostility environments and there was no Pakistan pavilion. And that, you know, that pavilion has a lot of information to convey to rest of the participants and world leaders over there. And the second most impressive thing is, of course, uh, uh, credit goes uh, to the current uh, uh, government and the uh, lady, lady minister for climate change minister Sharia Man Saiba. There is this very appealing message if you read at Pakistan Pavilion that what goes in Pakistan would not stay in Pakistan. You know, it, it's that means that it's going to impact everyone. This climate change phenomenon which is happening in Pakistan, going, it's going to be everywhere. That that that, that line meant. So uh, I think the the first day of the conference on Sunday when they did this press conference it was quite it was quite a crowd puller, and uh, the the unique feature of this year's uh, uh, Pakistani delegation uh, official Pakistani delegation is that you see there are members from different parties like from PMLN and People's Party and might be from other parties as well and they are like together and united at international platforms to enhance and to amplify the vulnerability of uh, uh, Pakistani communities which have recently gone through floods in different parts of Pakistan and um, the yesterday conference uh, uh, conference on Sunday actually sorry I'm sitting in different time zones so my days are like up, up and down so uh, this uh, on Sunday uh, evening when they did a conference at Pakistani Union along with uh, United uh, Nations um, Secretary General, it was uh, uh, there was like a lot of international media and later on also uh, international media also covered Bilawal Bhutto Zardari, Shari Aman Saiba in New York Times, on CNN, etc. Uh, and uh, to Prime Minister uh, Shehbashri Sahab as well. And it's really important to give your messages especially related to loss and damages. Of course, the third important thing which you asked is about the agenda, inclusion of agenda point loss and damage, which was never the part of discussion. And in previous calls, the civil society and media, we have been like an activist, keep pushing developed nations to include this agenda point. And this year, finally, that is in the agenda. That is that this discussion is happening. And at Pakistan Pavilion, as a uh, Prime Minister Shehbaz Sharif Saab did mention that in recent floods, we need like $30 billion from rich nations because because of them, we are experiencing repetitive with these floods and prolonged heat waves and, you know, glacial lake outburst bursts and uh, sea level rise at um, uh, Karachi side. So uh, there are a lot of positives uh, at this stage, but what that is going to give us, that is like very uncertain to say at this stage, because the last two days of the conference would uh, determine that how things are really going, because 198 countries negotiations are really hard to, uh, you know, it's really hard, you know, if, if you gather the member of four or five family members and try to bring them on the table and ask their opinion, it's very difficult to uh, convince them and bring them on consensus. So 198 countries representatives are negotiating uh, on carbon dioxide emissions and loss and damage on innovative ways for finance on food security, water, like there are a lot of thematic areas uh, on the conference to be discussed in uh, coming days. So uh, a lot is happening. Let's see where uh, these negotiations would go. And there are a lot of positives from uh, US, UK, and other countries as well related to loss and damage in terms of uh, uh, statements. But let's see uh, how practical would that be because our demand uh, is, yeah. You've talked about food insecurity. So is it really fair to say that we should be alarmed about how the situation is going on, especially the disruption in the global food supply chains and amid the rising population and how that intersects with the discourse on the climate change? You know, uh, climate change, when we talk about it, it's really a cross-sectoral issue. So it is directly related with food insecurity or food security issue as well, uh, and also the water security issue as well. You name it, any sector, and that is related to it. How it is related to food security is that, you know, first, due to uh, uh, rising temperatures uh, uh, from since the industrial era, the sowing and uh, uh, cropping and cultivating period has entirely changed. 
And that also changes the yield, crop yield as well, of course. And uh, also uh, one, one impact is this. Other impact is, of course, uh, relate, directly related to inflation as well. Whenever there is like climate related catastrophe like recent floods, it has just swept away all the fields and fruit orchards and our cash crops and farmers are left with nothing in flood affected areas. So that is the another impact, direct impact due to, you know, floods. Uh, uh, as well, one was like rising temperature, second is flood, that is also like climate and human induced phenomena, it's, it's not natural thing. And uh, of course, the other thing is that it does, of course, impact the climate change and uh, these all, it, it directly impacts your inflation rate and everything and also import export is also impacted uh, due to same like to mention supply of food chain, it's, 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 it's connected with a lot of a lot of other issues as well so it, so is related with food security and how that is being discussed uh, at uh, this uh, first day on, in the round tables as well that you know uh, farmers and uh, uh, different uh, people related uh, who are working in this field they really need uh, latest knowledge uh, and climate resilient crops and technology transfer and that rich nations should be paying under loss and damage mechanism uh, because due to their emissions uh, we as a developing countries are suffering and our crops are suffering and food insecurity is being caused because of those emissions and climate change impacts right definitely right. That, that 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 really you know spars the debate on another level when we talk about food insecurity mm -hmm. and you know steps being taken for food security as well uh miss kamal you were you know, before this, you were mentioning uh, the hope that you see from the youth and the energy that is there as well. How important is it to incorporate them uh, academically as well? Because I see a lot of um, people are now interested in, you know, uh, getting an academic degree in environmental True. sciences and climate change as well. Uh, their solutions when you talk about startups or uh, entrepreneurs, you know, who can actually make a difference we talk about low cost solutions for the uh, economy of Pakistan. How important is it to take that youth bulge on board, which we obviously say accounts for more than 60% of the population? I think very important. Mm -hmm. I, I think they're the ones who take it forward. Um, uh, what we're suffering now, of course, we have to mitigate food security. 7% um, we are still uh, un inundated, 7% uh, of Sindh is still inundated with water. Um, we are going to suffer uh, mm -hmm. uh, and agricultural food insecurity and we'll see the effects of it next year. Mm -hmm. So um, when we talk about the youth, we have to, I think this has to become part of our lives. It's not something extra that we're bringing in. Mm -hmm. I think this is how we need to change the lens that we start looking at when we live our lives. Mm -hmm. So uh, whether it is incorporating it in uh, entrepreneurship or social entrepreneurship or uh, encouraging the youth to take action, I think this becomes as important as we tell them to make a living. Mm -hmm. That okay, even as you make your living, it has to be with that lens of climate change. True. Or adaptation mm -hmm. or resilience. True. True. So I think those are the kind of yeah. uh, things that we need to start Very talking to them about. Yes. True. Uh, so we would like to thank uh, Ms. Mariam Shabir for joining us. And Emma, when we talk mm. more about the... If you can just allow me, I, I just have one... Uh, uh, Mariam, can you hear us? Yes. Yes, uh, I have one final question before we say uh, goodbye. How have you seen Prime Minister Shabaz Sharif as a statesman there in that conference? As I keep on mentioning, he said that he's got the extraordinary passion to work on climate change. He has been the center of attention as well. How do you see this on a diplomatic note? I think it's uh, really great the kind of statements uh, he made and it was uh, really a wise decision to tag along UN Secretary General because he visited uh, Pakistan during floods as well. And uh, the, the another thing which Prime Minister is doing great, which was not scheduled actually in his visit, is that uh, along uh, the side events and uh, participation in the meeting, he is informally meeting with uh, heads, different heads of states and we have seen on its, his official social media as well. And uh, of course, opposition and other uh, trolls there that it's not that really planned meeting. But I really appreciate this step because Pakistan right now, due to climate change, it's at a stage where every negotiation, every diplomatic uh, activity or diplomatic ties would be really, really helpful because that COP27 is also a platform to, uh, you know, pull uh, funders and uh, build collaboration and partnership with different countries and different uh, parties to COP27 as well. And it's really great step to do. Uh, Mariam Shabir, environmentalist, uh, talking to us.
here on World this morning. And I, I think it's very important, Hajra, that, you know, these meetings on the sidelines further improve not only bilateral relations True. but a joint mechanism on working on climate right. change. Right, and we see the more evolution of the climate diplomacy, mm -hmm. climate change diplomacy, which is so much essential to Climate diplomacy, relations. I think I, li yeah. I like that terminology. <laughs> right, which is so much pertinent to international relations here. Uh, Ms. Amina, coming back to you, we've seen in runner-up to the COP26, $100 billion were pledged. And OECD mentions that these pledges, rich countries are not ready to pay the bills because the bill is huge, right? <laughs> Uh, how do you think that fits into and how should Pakistan deal with this entire moment? Because there's a momentum on the climate change there. And also there's a talk of loss mm -hmm. and damage reparations going on there. How should we deal with that? I think that, uh, you know, absolutely, like even the Secretary General said, that the international community has a responsibility. And, and uh, Pakistan has been uh, hosting uh, large communities and now is suffering an international uh, an, an, an IDB situation within the country because of the floods True. and everything uh, of the climate change. So I think that absolutely the international community has a responsibility that it needs to fulfill. It, uh, the pledges are there. We need to actualize them now. Right. And I think that uh, the ask is, of course, much more. Right. And uh, it's not an unrealistic ask. It's not like we're just saying this, oh, mm -hmm. we want lots of money. No, that's not it. Right. It's a genuinely, it's coming out of a needs assessment that was done. Um, it is coming out of a very rigorous exercise. And even when we were asking for the uh, life-saving ones, we were absolutely prioritizing the essential. 33 million mm -hmm. people were affected. We said 20 million are in need. We are prioritizing 9.5. And it's a similar situation in the larger picture as well when we start mm -hmm. talking about the PDNA. We're not going out there and saying, oh, we want to have money for everything. No, these are people who act, this is an actual need. Right. And uh, a country like Pakistan cannot fulfill it on itself. So we do mm -hmm. need the support of the international community. We are looking at it. And uh, while the pledges are coming in, we're hoping that some of those donors who haven't been as forthcoming will uh, start, uh, you know, uh, coming to us and these bilateral meetings are extremely important. How we use the COP is up to Pakistan and mm -hmm. is up to the government and they're doing an excellent job. I think the minister is doing a great job. Mm -hmm. The prime minister being there and, uh, you know, the fact that, the sec you know, uh, uh, on the um, uh, conversations with the secretary general becoming the co-chair for the COP. Right. It, these are huge uh, steps. Definitely. Right, definitely. So, Ahmed, we have a guest with us uh, mm. on the call. So, uh, Brigadier Saab, Assalamu alaikum. We have been joined by Brigadier Tugrul Yamin Saab, who happens to be also the dean of uh, SIPS department at NAS. Assalamu alaikum, sir. Wa alaikum, assalam. Sir, so we've seen that in the runner-up to the COP26 conference, $100 billion were pledged, right? And OECD report mentions that the rich countries are not ready to give that money because the bill is very huge. Uh, should we expect major breakthroughs in this conference? What is the significance of that? Uh, uh, Hajar, the conference is important uh, because it has uh, allowed, uh, given Pakistan a platform to voice its apprehensions about the climate disaster which hit uh, us this year in a very, very bad and significant way. Uh, but apart from that, uh, I really do not expect the international community to be chipping in to help us uh, uh, overcome whatever disaster uh, which uh, visited us. The reason being that if they, they start uh, giving us money, this would be a tacit acceptance that they are the culprits. And I do not think that they will do that. They will give some money, uh, barely enough for you to survive, but in the larger uh, context, they will not give you the money. That's how I look at it. Uh, basically, you will have to fend for yourself. There are many things that we need to do uh, ourselves. That we need to uh, have some internal introspection because uh, we ourselves are also responsible in many ways for despoiling our environment. You go to the mountains, you found them littered with uh, waste stuff, plastic bottles, thing like, things like that. Our uh, uh, main rivers have been polluted because uh, we use them more uh, as uh, a way of uh, disposing of our uh, garbage than keeping them clean. Our uh, mangrove forests are dying because uh, raw sewage is being uh, poured into Karachi and urban, uh, urban places uh, along our uh, coastlines directly into the sea. So there are many things that we need to do. For example, I tell you that 10 years ago, I, went, I visited Swat after it was hit by massive floods. 
and uh, I saw that uh, hotels had been constructed right. just Thank next to Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Thank uh, you very much, Dr. Tugul. I mean, yes. Uh, unfortunately, I, we are really short really in the short time. time. But he mentioned a very important point. What? Each of us has a responsibility. True. That's true. That's true. And we should not be looking towards yes. these rich countries that really Absolutely. need to do that. We need to do it play ourselves. our pa part. And so that Ms. Kamal, thank you very much to you as well thank for joining so us. It's very interesting, a, uh, very, I think, in-depth discussion as well. And, you, well, you know, like we said, it's the onus is up to you. Plant true. a tree, save water, whatever you can do is up to you as well. But from us and the entire team, it is goodbye, but with one, two, three, good morning.